uh, yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, I, you, you've always been like one of those guys that, um, has been an inspiration not to not only like guys like me but like to everybody i mean there's if there's anybody out there that is experiencing any kind of adversity whatever it is i mean it could be as extreme as what you went through or just just some little stuff that they're going through on a day-to-day you have set the example for others to follow i mean you have you've been there you've been the kind of guy that's like has been through it all i mean not forget about your injury in in 05 i mean I, i was just I was going through your bio and I, I mean, you, you experienced adversity, like right off the bat, like right as, when you were a kid. So if anybody is looking for that kind of inspiration to pick themselves up, you're the guy for sure. So, yeah, I mean, thanks a lot for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks AD. And I appreciate those kind words you said, you know, it's, it, it's always weird when people say that about me. And, you know, I, I just think myself as, you know, regular old DT, you know, just hangs out, you know, with his buddies, you know, once in a while, I may have some bourbon, you know, and, and play some right, right. booty, you know, and talk smack. But, you know, it, it is hard. It's still hard when people see me in that light, uh, you know, because I, I just, I figure we all have it, you yeah. know, we just haven't maybe had to experience it. You know, right. so sometimes we do later in our life. And, I, and in my case, I I started experiencing it pretty young, yeah. uh, that adversary and overcoming odds. And, and, and and that's what I try and do, you know, I, I really do, you know, but I all, I do all base it on, on that promise I made to my dad uh, the night before he passed, you know, and that, that's what shaped me, you know, the, the words, the promise to take care of your, your brothers, sisters, your family. And yeah, that first started with the whole, with my mom and dad, or my mom and brothers and sisters, then my, my, my brothers and sisters, and, and it just kept evolving to my teammates, uh, doesn't matter if they're attack P or we're downrange, you know, when we're downrange, Army, Navy, Marines, when we're down there, we're all brothers and sisters, man. We all take care of each other. Right. To when I got hurt, you know, all those wounded guys. And and now it's pretty much any, anyone that, that needs help, man, sometimes needs to help find their spark. Because like, like yeah. I said, we have that spark, man. We all do. It's kind of ironic that a burn guy's over here talking about having a spark, <laughs> you know. But... You know, we all have that. Sometimes we can find it on our own, you know, and sometimes you you need help finding it. And and, and if my my journey helps people find it, you know, it's it's worth it. And that's what I ch- just try and do, man. It's right. really a, a 12-year-old kid trying to honor his dad and not let him know. Really, that's that's what it comes down to it. Well, let's back up. Let's talk about that. I Like I, like you said, um, I, like, again, I was just fascinated by your your childhood and your upbringing and your whole journey and um so yeah talk to me about that talk to me you can start wherever you want but I, i'd love to hear about like how what that went down with that and what you what you and your dad discussed and and just kind of go from there with you taking care of your family and then man you it wasn't just i mean you and your mom had to do it for a while but then after a while it was just you and man oh man i just can't imagine what you're i mean just the just stepping up at that age is is commendable man for sure yeah you know all of us, you know, you know, the majority of our dads are, are everything for us, you know, right. And our dads are heroes, you know, and that's who, well, my dad, you know, I, you know, I played baseball and soccer. He wasn't too keen on baseball. He was more, you know, into soccer. So we would go to soccer matches and he'll come watch me play soccer. And, but you know, the last year, a half year and a half of his life, he couldn't work anymore. He had uh, issues with his lungs. Uh, he was on a respirator and he had gone to Mexico uh, to try and see if they could help him over there. Yeah. Uh, he had left right after uh, uh, Thanksgiving. He calls us on January 25th of 1988 and, and he talks to everyone. I'm the last one to speak to him and typical, you know, you know, father, son conversation. Are you, are you doing okay? Are you behaving? You listen to mom. You know, how's your grades? You know, uh, you know, you're doing good in sports. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And, and and then, you know, he says the weirdest thing, you know. I was like, son, I got something, one last thing I want to tell you. I was like, okay, what, what's up, Dad? I was like, I need you to promise me that you will take care of your brothers, sisters, and your family. And I'm like, huh? And I was like, yeah, please promise me that. So it makes me repeat it. And I was like, yeah, Dad, I promise to take care of my brothers, sisters, and my family. 
And for a 12 year old kid, you know, I go, oh, okay, oh, whatever, whatever, whatever that, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, like, you weren't thinking like down the line, like you were actually going to have to do it. You're like, whatever. Yeah. yeah. All right. You know, this is like a whatever moment. And then, you know, we, you know, I asked if you wanted to talk to anyone else. Like, no, I was like, I was like, just, you know, we'll talk again. I was like, okay. And we hung up and, you know, next day go to school, everything. We're coming back from school and, we're in the car, you know, my mom, my brother, sister, one of my cousins. And as we pull up to the driveway, two of my older cousins are there. And usually they're always smiling. It was great, to, you know, great to see them. Right. This time, man, they had a sober face. And, you know, I come out of the car, it's like, hey, cousin, how you doing? And yeah. they're just quiet. And so we go into the house and they tell my mom, you know, tell, tell the kids, you know, tell, the kids go into their bedrooms. Well, you know, 12 years old, I'm, I'm curious what, what's going on. Sure. So, cause my room was next to the kitchen and the dining room was right next to the kitchen. So I, I just got out of the, the doorway of my room. I can see what's going on. So I did that. And, you know, I just remember my cousin's talking to her and then all of a sudden my mom just starts crying and drops. And, and, and I knew instantly. Yeah. I knew instantly what had happened. Uh, I knew that I had lost my dad. Man. Uh, and it was tough. I, I, like I said, I didn't I know if he knew that he wasn't coming back, you know, but, yeah. you know, he gave me those last parting words and, and, and I took those words to heart. And so, you know, we, you know, I tried my best when, when it was just myself, my brothers and sisters and my mom. And, you know, my mom, I like to say she lost her way. Yeah. Uh, she really, she lost her way. There's many times I try to bring her back to refocus. Uh, you know, you, know, you have, you know, kids, you have a 12 year old, a 10 year old, an eight year old, and a six year old. Man. Uh, but, you know, she just wasn't trying, you know, affected her differently. And, you know, it, you know started dating dudes and it just, it wasn't a good situation. And yeah. I always try to, you know, mess it up, but, one time, you know, like I guess she had it and she, she, I mean, she beat the shit out of me. And so then tells me, you, you call your grandma or, or your aunts and uncles again. Uh, I will send her to boarding school and you'll never see your brothers and sisters again. Oh my God. And, and I'm like, well, I was like, I can't do that. You know, if I, if I, if I don't see my brothers and sisters, I'm, how am I honoring my dad? You know, that promise. Right, right. So, you know, I just started focusing on my brothers and sisters and, and, you know, every here and now I will try and, you know, reel in my mom. It's like, hey mom, you know, you know, it wasn't always bad. Well, we, we had our good moments. Yeah. Uh, and I remember one time, you know, I had a dream, you know, it was crazy that, you know, she, she had died in an accident. And I, I was talking to her, you know, mom, you know, I had this dream and she just kind of laughed it off. And it's like, you know, it, it felt so real. Right, right. And she was like, you know what? I was like, if I die, this is where I want to be buried. And who would have thought, you know, you know, a year and a half after my dad passes, you know, she gets killed by a drunk driver. You know, she was on a oh motorcycle. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, Dude. you know, but knowing, at least I knew where she wanted to be buried. At least I right. had that. But I, I was angry, man. I ain't gonna lie, you know. When she got in that accident, that, 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 the day, or she got hurt at night, and that following morning, I was supposed to go on my eighth grade trip, graduation trip. And, you know, I remember the cops knocking. It's like, hey, do you know, is this a house for, where Maria del Toro lives? I'm like, yeah. It's like, is she here? It's like, I don't know. I'm like, who's here? It's like, well, it's just me and my brother and sister. It's like, do you have someone to, I, we can call? Well, like an aunt and uncle or grandparents? Like, yeah. And obviously they tell us that, you know, she survived until July and then she, her, her wounds overcame her. Oh my God. I'm sorry to hear that, man. But, you know, I was angry. You know, I, you know, we buried her and, and I cursed her. I cursed her. I was like, why did he not listen? And, and to this day, I still haven't been to, to her, to her gravesite. And, you know, people was like, you gotta, 
forgive and, and let go, but it's tough. It's it tough. Is, yeah. And in and, 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 and the book, you know, because people always ask me, you always talk about your dad in your speeches. It's always about you never talk about your mom. And I felt, you know, me writing this book kind of will explain why I rarely talk about my mom. Sure. Um, but, you know, maybe one day, you know, I'll, I'll finally kind of let it go. But to this day, it's still tough, you know. Uh, but yeah, you know, now, now I just had to focus on my brothers and sisters. And, you know, our grandparents took us in, but it, it, it was still tough with that. You know, like my grandpa was real old fashioned. You know, think about it, he's he's two generations behind us. All right, right. You know, he's that generation where, you know, girls stayed in the house, you know, like cooking clean and boys were outside doing all the, the work. And, and you gotta understand my brother, my sisters, you know, at least my oldest, she was a, a volleyball player. Yeah. And, and once, you know, my, my grandparents, you know, took us in, that stopped. So I, I had a lot of times had to be the person in the middle kind of navigating, you know, the fights and come on, grandpa, let her do this. Come on, grandpa, let's, you know, it's okay. I'll go with her. Right, right. You know? and so, you know, again, trying to, to honor that promise. Uh, and then I headed off to college um, and came back home one day, my freshman year, and my grandpa gets a stroke and got paralyzed from left side down, bro. And, and I wanted to quit school at that time. I was like, you know what? I was like, I got, I got to get get out of school. Yeah. And my grandma was like, no, no, keep going to school. So I went, finished my freshman year, started my sophomore year, and then my grandma gets diagnosed with cancer. Oh and, my god, dude! And I drop out after my during my my sophomore year uh, first semester. I was like, how how are they going to be able to take care of teenagers, straight teenagers? Yeah. You know. You know, grandpa's paralyzed from left side down. Grandma now has cancer. She's going through all. So, so, you know, it, you know I it's, mean, it's hard enough with like parent, like, like regular parents, like, let alone like elderly kind of grandparents that are going through health problems. I mean, I can't imagine what they were going through. They, oh man. Yeah. And you know, I, you know, but it was a sacrifice I was willing to do. Yeah. You know, it was a sacrifice I was willing to do for my dad and for my brothers and sisters. So, you know, they, you know, I did that and, you know, and there were some situations that, you know, unfortunately I had to deal with my grandparents. Uh, uh, and it hurt, you know, for a while my grandparents were upset with me because, you know, I, I went to that situation uh, mm -hmm. uh, when it came, you know, when money was, you know, missing and stuff like that. Because uh, we ended up only... I think from all the years my dad worked and all everything they saved and my grand, my mom, you know, the, the houses, the owner ended up having left for us, I think, 10 grand, you know, out of everything. Uh, and, and you know, again, it, it, was, it was tough. Imagine you're try, you have to sue your grandparents, man. Oh, oh you my have God. To sue your grandparents. Yeah. The, the, the you know grandparents accept that to try and take care of you, but I, again, I was like, "Where's where's everything going?" Right, right. You know how did the, what the estate of my parents all of a sudden dwindle to nothing? Yeah. Um, but again, I had to do it. From you know, sometimes we got to do these tough decisions for our loved ones. You know. Right. And, well, like you said, you made that promise to your dad to take care of your siblings. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. I mean, that's, you have to, you had to do it. So I do it. And yeah, you know, by, and by, you know, it took, took about a good year to kind of the relationship get, get back to normal with my grandparents. I think they kind of understood why I did it. Right. Uh, but, but by this time now, you know, I'm 22 and I got a real good job, man. <laughs> I'm making good money, you know, at this chemical plant. And, but I, dude, I just felt so unfulfilled. Yeah. I, felt, I was like, man, what, what am I doing with my life? Right. I was like, cause I was 22. My sister was engaged. She was 20. My bro was 18. And my little sister was kind of already living with my sister. Mm -hmm. uh, cause at one point I, I did take full custody of my brother and sisters from my grandparents. Oh, okay. Um, 
uh, so especially after the whole, you know, court stuff. Right, right. Uh, but I was like, damn, I just I didn't, I felt like I wasn't, you know, wasn't, you know, living up to my potential. Sure. And, and, and then, you know, I saw, you know, I saw a commercial, you know, for the Air Force, like, huh, you know, no one in my family's ever done it. Yeah. You know, and, <laughs> and you know, I, we, I grew up with the generation of Rambo, bro. Who didn't want right. to be freaking Rambo? Yeah. Uh, who didn't want to have that long hair, chiseled body? You know, obviously I don't have the long hair no more. And the bod is, like my son likes to say, is a dad bod, you know? <laughs> right. I still all with that little runt. But, you know, <laughs> who didn't want to be that guy? You know, yeah. you know, you know. Uh, so, you know, I, I went in. But, of course, I did ask friends that had been in the military. It's like, hey, man, what, what branch do you think I should join? You know, because I had friends that were Army, friends that were Marines. Uh, I'd had every Navy guy, any Navy friends. But yeah. all of them right away, they're like, dude, got to go Air Force. Yeah. I was like, why? I was like, dude, they're the best at taking care of the people. They got the best facilities. But, dude, they have the hottest chicks. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. I was like, 22 years old, bro. He was like, why I mean, not? That, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that says it all right there. That says it all. You know, checked like, all the boxes. All right. Checked yeah, all the boxes. It. <laughs> and I, I going to basic and you know being yelled at in basic 22 years old it was it was like again i'm a generation where i played football and freaking the coaches just grab you from the helmet and right. slam you and just just go <laughs> off on you you know yeah, so yeah. me being yelled at, i was like eh. you know right, then, right, right. then me being hispanic i was used to it you know the only thing i had to worry <laughs> about is like is the chocolate gonna come flying out somewhere yeah, yeah. uh <laughs> But then I remember the like the the tech recruiter coming through, and he starts, you know, I remember he freaking had his bray on. He was all bashed out. You know, he was Ranger. Uh, he had his you know jungle boots back then, you know, freaking nice and shiny, the tip and the heel. Oh yeah. You know, it, it, I was like, damn. <laughs> and he starts talking, you know, talking about what the job can be, blah blah blah. You know, you're the one making the difference. You're calling in airstrikes. Yeah. And, and dude, I swear, man, I, you know, maybe it's because I got blown up and, you know, I, I don't remember, but I swear he walked in with the stogie, man. I swear to God. He <laughs> might have. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm seeing real Rambo. <laughs> and, and then he finished off the spiel, bro. He was like, gentlemen, you know what's the great thing about being a tech I was like, what, Sergeant? I was like, see the spray I got on? Yes, Sergeant. It helps me pick up girls. And I was like, dude, I was like, I came in because they said the Air Force has the best looking girls. And now you tell me a black race going to enhance that? Right, right. I was like, I'm in, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I tried yeah. out and uh, I made it. And then I headed off to tech school as there at Herbert Field. And, and you know, it, for me, it wasn't bad, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I enjoyed it. You know, I, I, was, I always tried to stay in shape. So it wasn't that, you know, tough for me. But I do remember when we had to do the field, yeah, you know, our, our night nav individual, oh, yeah. and given our safety brief, man. And I think, I don't remember who was Ramos or, or, uh, MacArthur who, who gave the safety brief and, and they start going into, you know, all you got guys be careful. There's snakes out there. You know, there, there's gators out there. I'm like, okay, we're in Florida. And dude, all of a sudden every second single predator, was was in Florida, lions, bears. <laughs> yeah. I, was like, what the fuck? I was like, you know, I'm, I'm from the Chicago area. The most I've ever seen was Grant Park, you know. Right. Park. <laughs> and so I'm thinking in my head, it's like, man, I had this pocket knife. I was like, swear to God, anything comes at me, I'm just going to stab him. Around. If I right. stab one of the instructors, they shouldn't try to scare me, dude. Right, right. And so I, so I continue, you know, I get to my, I get to a point where, or dude, I, I'm literally in the ravine, crawling on my hands and knees. You know, we have our radios, you know, our rock, and and our weapons, and there's wait a minute vines everywhere. Oh, the you worst! Know, everywhere, the worst. just snagging. And I get to a point, dude. I was like, "Fuck this!" <laughs> yeah. I was like, "I'm damn 22 years old. Why am I going through this crap?" Right, right. Why? And and. and then I started thinking about my dad again. 
you know, because, you know, my, my, my dad wouldn't want me to quit. My dad used to tell me, if you don't succeed, it's only on you. Don't you blame right. anybody else. Don't you blame your, where you came from or who, you know, or what, what color skin you are. If you don't succeed, it's on you. Yeah. I remember that. And I just relaxed, you know, breathed. He looked at my map, looked at my compass, got my azimuth, and I made it my point. I'm like, yes. You know, and, and then, you know, I head off to obviously survival school, which, you know, that wasn't a big, you know, too big of a thing. It's just, yeah. it was funny. You know, I had a, a, like this old uh, major re uh, reserve and he was a chaplain. And I'm like, sir, what are you doing here? I was like, I don't know. I'm like, sir, did you not, did, did you not pray enough or something? Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, unfortunately, he didn't, he didn't make it through. And, and then I'd be kind of. Oh, no. Oh, no. He hurt his knee. On, on, oh, okay. okay. Uh, so he washed out. And, and I ended up being a development leader. And there was only uh, three other guys. And because I was, the, you know, the seer guys, they know what we do. So, like, hey, let's make you a development leader and help these yeah, young yeah. airmen going through. And there's this one cat man. He he didn't know how to walk on snow. You know, you don't put all your 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 weight every time you step, or you're just gonna be going right through and just tumbling. And right. that's what he, and he was just hating life. <laughs> so I figured, you know what? I know how to. I was like, I'm gonna cheer him up. You know, it's like there's there's always that point where we gotta you know, we gotta kill the rabbit right. and skin him and you know eat him. So we do that. And the way to cheer him up, man. I put my hand in the hide and made like a little puppet. <laughs> and he's like, looking at him, he's like, dude, you are not right in the head. <laughs> but, it, you know, it, it cheered him up again, you know. Sure. It, it made him forget about how the suck suck. Right, right, know? right. And made him have him get through it. You know, we went through it, you know, you know, then got captured. And, and I went through uh survival school with mariano jeff mariano and jeremy ortiz and i remember we're 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 you know we're obviously we're captured and you know they make us take our you know stuff off yeah. and, and of course ortiz has a tech t-shirt on underneath and then all of a sudden his, his freaking coin comes ding ding oh. ding and they're like Oh, look what we got oh here. My God. Oh, tattoo. <laughs> oh, okay. And I was like, freaking Jeremy, dude. <laughs> freaking Jeremy. <laughs> so, you know, they interrogate us, that they, they get to me and they're like, we know your tattoo. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I was like, you better tell us what we want to hear. Or you, the, you see that wench out there? Because we had a female with us. I was like, we're going to torture her. And I'm like, no, go ahead. Yeah. She knew what she was getting into. Yeah. yeah. For me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was funny because I made the the instructor uh, break uh, his his role. He started. Oh, giggling. really? Dude, he wasn't expecting that response. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, "That's not easy to do. Those guys not, are pretty good, so that's not, not a hard thing to do." do. And, and you know, he had to leave. <laughs> and obviously, once like we, we graduated, you know, the, that instructor's like, "Dude." That was pretty good, man. I got another <laughs> character, but <laughs> I was not expecting that response. <laughs> but you know, then we, you know, graduate, go to jump school. And jump school is nothing, you know. It's just yeah, honestly, yeah. what are you doing here, Air Force? Blah blah blah. I was like, right, well, right. obviously, you don't know who I am, or you know, I don't know our career field. So, you know, maybe ask your instructor; <laughs> he'll tell yeah, you why. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and graduated and. And then got to Fort Bragg, man. Uh, or is this still, can we still say Fort Bragg? Or... Hey, you, yeah, at the time it was Fort Bragg, right? Yeah. I don't Liberty. know. What is it? Liberty now or something? I don't even... I'm going to be hurt feelings if I say Fort Bragg. Yeah. You know, cause, yeah I really don't care because I my feelings burned away a long time ago. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, got Fort Bragg. And then I just started my, what I wanted to be that guy to call in the airstrikes. I wanted to be a JTAC, man. You know, I always hated doing all the, tr all the training, all the coordination. And right when the plane, you know, the aircraft's coming in, the instructor takes the damn mic and says, right. clear I was like, yeah. man. And so like, that's the payoff. That's what you, that's the piece you want to do. <laughs> that's yeah. the thing. That's the okay. Yeah. It's cool. You get to, you know, you get to you maybe a, a little flyby low, but you want to be that guy to, you know, you want to say, clear oh, yeah. 
You oh, want yeah. to be that guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we, I got qualified at the same time as, as, as Zach, you know, Robert Zachary and, sure. uh, and, uh, what's an Abe Martins. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Little, little, little Abe. Uh, and so we all got uh, certified at the same time. And then obviously 9-11 happened and, and that was crazy. You uh, know, I remember being at a hazmat class uh, uh, with me and, and uh, Dusty Hodges. And and this guy comes running through, running through the office like, hey, the towers got hit by a plane. We're like, what? Yeah. And they almost kind of like smiled and like we thought we were, he was joking. Right. And then he, they turn on the TV and that's when we see the second plane hit. We're like, holy shit. And you know we we're we we're on DRB, and I, we had oh, okay. pagers, you know, yeah. little pagers just bing 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 bing. And for you young folk, these these little things, you know, black, they just beep. You know, if you want to say certain words, you you would type it in, you know, with the phone yeah. number, you know. <laughs> uh, so we head back to the squadron, and dude, it was like madness, bro, madness. Weapons coming, you know, getting out, everyone getting their gear in, and you know, and we're ready to head out. Yeah. You know, but, you know, I didn't get to go on that first go because I had just got back from Bosnia. You okay. know, literally had been back home maybe two months. And so Zach and Abe ended up going, you know. Okay. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I, I might have had a little jelly, a little, <laughs> yeah. little jealousy because they went out on the first go. But, you know, I knew they were going to freaking crush it. I knew those two were going to crush it, you know. Right. You know, because we were together, you know, we went to JFCC, we went to get qualified together. I knew they were, those two would do great things, and they did. They did yeah. amazing things. Yeah, those two guys are awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you know that happens, and, you know, we I had a, then Iraq kicks off, and, you know, they're on the first push. Uh, and I remember I was going to be, we are going to jump in. You know, the, you know, because I went out, I went with the 82nd at that moment, and we were going to jump in. And but the intel dude was telling us that they had all this uh, anti-aircraft every all over the place, so we would have been sh shredded. Oh yeah. And I was, I think I, I went up either first stick or second stick. So you know, I was, I, I was one of the first ones in. Yeah. And. It got it got canceled, and I remember the the army guys were so pissed. Like, dude, we're gonna go. We we're supposed to jump in. I was like, dude, we wouldn't have seen any of the fight. We yeah, would have nobody would have made it. Yeah. We would have been dead. It, it wasn't yeah. gonna happen. And so you know, we next plan was like, all right, we're gonna uh, go into uh, I think it was Talil, the air base, mm -hmm. and we're gonna go see one thirties. You know, two gun trucks, twenty guys. And I think there originally there was like I want to say like five or six. Uh, C-130 doesn't do it, uh -huh. and we we land, we get off, planes take off, the plane takes off, and then we're noticing no one else lands. Oh no! And, and of course, you know the army right away looks at me. He's like, "Hey, Air Force, what's going on? Where's everyone out?" I'm like, dude, I don't know, man. I, I call in airstrikes, bro. I don't right. control, yeah. you know? Those aren't my planes. Yeah. Those aren't my planes, man. <laughs> <laughs> But eventually it's like, hey, because literally, man, as soon as our plane took off, man, it was just, you know, you see fires going off everywhere. Oh, man. And we get told, like, yeah, it's just you guys until the main force was driving up. Oh. And we're like, well, I was like, if, if it's us, we're going to fight to the end. And, you know, none of us are going to get captured. Right. And, and luckily, you know, we had a good bunch of airstrikes and, and and we made it. You know, I just remember seeing the man force and like, oh, thank God I'm going to get to sleep because I think I, had, I maybe slept four hours out of like, I want to say 40, 48, 50 yeah. hours. Yeah, just, and that was probably, it probably wasn't good sleep and it was probably just like passing yeah. out just out of exhaustion. I mean, I'm sure you guys were just on alert the whole time. Yeah, I'm sure. We had two gun trucks and, you know, and I was oh. pretty much the fire support. Oh my God. Uh, and, you know, we headed off up, up north and we got to a, a Samoan. That was one of the, probably one of the big, big battles we had. 
where the Ba'ath Party members controlled the north side uh, of, of Samoa, and we had the south because it was divided by east-west running river. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't get across because these guys were using taxis to reposition themselves. And, and we're like, you know, rules of engagement, we couldn't attack them. Sure. Uh, so we just weren't making any progress. And I remember we got uh, the orders that we, they, were, they were viable targets now. Oh, okay. I remember the, the commander looking at me, he's like, it's like DT. I was like, get some aircrafts and destroy any vehicle because there's a big uh, north south running road that they were using to reposition. It was like anything on that road, man, shred it. Roger that. <laughs> I was like, get on the mic and we get two A10s. I was like, yes, perfect. 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 And, yeah. and so I tell them the situations, like, all right, do you see, you know, the town that's divided by East West Running River? Roger that. Okay, now do you see a road that comes down, uh, that goes, heads uh, south to north that con connects to the, the East West Running River? Roger that. All right, friendlies are uh, to the South of our River. Any vehicle on that north south running road on the north side of the east west running river is a viable target. You are clear to engage. Nice. Like, Roger that. So they do their thing and they come back. It's like, hey, so I, do you want us to hit like the guys heading north or heading south? And I guess like, any target on there is a viable target. <laughs> like you are clear to engage. Roger. So they do another thing, come back. Hey, man, we're, we're just wondering. What about the parked cars? And I was like, dude, I literally say, dude, they're not out here shopping, man. They're out here trying to kill us. Right. Anything that road is a target. And they ride it and they come in and they're like, one's in, it's like cleared out. And, and thank God there were no, no selfie sticks at that time. Yeah. The army guy is getting up and trying to see, he's like, dude, we're gonna, you're going to get shot you stick your head out. Because <laughs> I can see it was a selfie stick. And they're like, click, 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 click. Right, right. Uh, and they come in. And Tuesday, and clear out. They do another run, and they cleared them, and then we get across. And I remember my, my troop. You know, we pass this taxi, and it was just shredded. Yeah. You know, the guy in there, the, his body from his shoulder down to his waist, is just gone. And, and we get to our, our point. And I remember my roadmat. You know, I think it was Browning. I think it was Browning. He's like, he's like, TT. He's like, I've never seen anything like that. I'm like, hey, man, I've never seen anything like that either. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And we go and we get all the way to freaking Fallujah. And dude, Fallujah, we, we're down in the middle and and we're just laying there, you know. Typical, you think of like Vietnam, shirts off, we're hanging out. <laughs> and, and then, you know, we get the call that the commander wants us to come in. And we come in and he, he tells us, hey, we just lost uh, Ray Lozano. And I'm like, yeah. okay. and you know, Ray had only been in our unit six months. Yeah. He had a, a little girl, his wife was pregnant with their oh, second child, you know, and he, he was a guy I trained. He was my troop, man. Yeah. And, and that was tough. Yeah. That was tough. You know, they flew back, the guys that were close to him. Uh, and, and we always, I always like to tell people, like, you know, us operators, yeah, we're these knuckle draggers, nerves of steel. But man, when we lose one of our own, man, it hurts. Yeah. It hurts bad. Yeah. And I remember we go to Sarah and then we bear him learning 10. And that was a tough thing. That was tough. That was tough there in uh, Ray. Yeah. And come home, come home. You know, by this time, I'm, you know, I'm married and I have my little kid. Just thinking we're going to have a hang good old time. And then we, uh, I got orders to Korea and, and I head off to Korea. And oh, that was, I didn't want to go to Korea. Right. Uh, uh, but I ended up going to Osan. But I was glad. I actually was very glad I went because, you know, sometimes we, as operators, we're, we think everyone else that's not an operator is doesn't work out. They're slobs, you know. They're just hanging on the computers, eating bonbons. <laughs> but when I got to Korea, I got to see the whole the whole picture. Mm -hmm. I got to see all that support that we get when 
the aircraft gets there because I was a, a Babel trainer there at the 25th Fighter Squadron, okay. uh, the Eighth Squadron. You get to see, you know, the, the mechanics, making sure those planes are working the, to the am, ammo guys, the, you know, the the, uh, the the admin people, you know, to the trainers. And, and just, I, it opened my eyes. I'm like, yeah. I was like, okay, yeah, they may not be the tip of the spear, but but they're that handle that makes that spear hit its target. And we sure. need uh, so I was very glad, and you know, it, it opened my eyes uh, to that, uh, and my attitude changed. Yeah, I mean, it had to be interesting. Like you use those A10s on those vehicles on that road. Now you get to see the backside of that, like how how those deployed, and you know what what made those guys come to you. You know what I mean? I mean, if it wasn't for all those dudes you were just just talking about, those A10s wouldn't have, wouldn't have been able to show up and and yeah. work for you. You know, and, so yeah. And, and so I was, you know, I was very grateful going to Korea. And yeah, yeah. Have my eyes open that way, because again, we know how we are. Sure. <laughs> oh yeah. Sometimes we we stay in our own little circle and we don't yeah. care about no one else. If we're not out there PTing with us, we don't care. You know. Right. Right. Uh, and but then you know, and I was and I was very grateful. And then I, I got introduced to Soju. Taking ammo policy, I was like, I remember one time waking up in my bed and I had uh, Miss Lee's burger next to me. I was like, how the hell did this happen? <laughs> you know? uh, but it was a great you, you, uh, opening experience learning, you know, going to Korea and all that. Yeah. And heading off to uh, Italy, my, my assignment I always wanted, man, was like Vincenzo Italy. It's like, hell yeah. yeah. But before I headed out, I think it was December, uh, Lunk, Lunk was, calls me and tells me, he's like, hey man, I just wanted to get you, let you know that you're gonna head out in August to Afghanistan. It's like, all right, for how long? About seven, eight months. I'm like, all right. And you know, we're getting there, me and my family in February of 05. Man. I was like, dude, how am I gonna tell my wife, man? I was like, I just freaking you're just gone for a year. Iraq. I was a, a year in Korea. Yeah. And, and now in six months I'm gonna head out. So I, dude, I had this plan, man. I was like, my wife's hardcore Catholic. You know, she, you know, she loved Pope John Paul II. Yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell her in front of the Pope, and she can't yell at me in front right. of the Pope. You know, I'm dead, I'm, I'm dead, dead serious thinking that. <laughs> and then, uh, if anyone knows the history of Pope John Paul II, you know, he dies in April. Of 2005. Oh, that's like, right. I was like, oh, oh you ruined my plans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think I was like, all right, we'll go to a funeral on top of there. Well, Italy's full of Catholics, man. You can take a train, drive, fly in there. It was just, unless you were somebody, you weren't going to get into Rome. Yeah. So I was like, all right, well, I'll tell her afterwards. Well, afterwards, now June. I head out in August. Oh. And, and, and you know, I tell her, and, there in the Coliseum with, I made sure to have my two-year-old son in my arms, <laughs> just in case she attacked me. I was like, sorry, son, you're gonna be a human shield. <laughs> yeah. And I tell her, and she doesn't say anything. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm thinking, oh my God, my my, my plan worked. Yeah. We're good to go. <laughs> we got to the we got to the room, man. That's where I saw Devil Face. Anyone that has a spouse knows what Devil Face is. Yes, yeah. you know, you screwed up. Yeah. And we get into it. I mean, we get into it just arguing. And, but it was my fault. Yeah. I knew since December of 04. And I wait till June of 05 to tell my wife. Yeah. And she got to one point where she tells me, after this tour, you get out or we're over. And I was like, how can you say that to me? And again, it wasn't, she wasn't trying to be vindictive. Sure, sure. But I always said, I'll never let my son grow up without his dad like I did. But yet, my son was going to turn three and maybe knew me eight months out of his life. So he was growing up without his dad. Yeah. But this is how great my wife is. She kind of said, we'll talk about this later. I'll let you concentrate to go downrange. You know, even though she was pissed, she 
put everything, you know, so I can concentrate, you know, on hold so I can concentrate and go down range. Right, right. So, you know, I head down range in August and, you know, I'm out there nonstop going in and out on missions because, you know, I was, we had two JTACs, but uh, Furman, he was in COIC, so we were staying in the talk most of the time. So it was just me constantly going out and, you know, how it works, you know, it, they're going to send you where they think there's going to be the most danger. Right, right. They think they're going to get into, you know, possibly anything. Yeah. You know, so they have that fire support. And the day, you know, the day I got hit, you know, I was out with the scout team. And and we're coming back. But well, the night prior, to, it, it was, you know, we're, we're doing uh, two hours sleep, one hour of a watch. And... You know, it was like the calm before the storm. Yeah. I, I remember looking up and, and I always compare it to when Forrest Gump's talking to Jenny about when he was in Vietnam and when it stopped raining, all these lights, uh, or uh, the clouds open up and you can see every single star. Oh, right, right. And, and, and that's what it felt like, dude. I, I was like, it was so calm. I was like, wow. And then that next morning, you know, we go out when we kind of hit um, a town down there because, you know, the, the whole purpose of us being out there is when we had into there's a high value target we had to capture a kill and a supply route we had to destroy. Yeah. And just we just weren't finding anything. Uh, so we're, we're coming back. We we're going to pick up the other half of the scout team that was up on the mountain trying to catch these guys, you know, just in case they're, you know, coming up there. And we're coming back across this creek and no more than 200 meters up to cross this creek do I feel this intense heat blast on the left side. And I was like, holy shit, I just got hit. And people talk about, man, that your life flashed in front of you, but I never really believed that. Man, when I got hit, all these memories started coming through. It was almost like a like a movie reel. Yeah. You know, it was like all these images. But the, the things I remember the most is three things that hadn't happened yet. Uh, it was one was like me and my wife finally getting married by the Catholic Church because every time we, we we tried, you know, I, I had I had on out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, second one was me and her honeymoon in Greece because that's where she always wanted to go. But lastly, was me teaching my boy how to play ball, man, because I was a ball player. Uh, and then something in my head clicks like, dude, you got to get out of this truck. And I got out of the truck, but, but I was on fire from head to toe. Oh, my God. Uh, but I knew there was that creek behind me, about 200 meters. So I turn and I run, but the flames overtook me and I collapse. And I'm thinking, this is it. I'm going to die here. Like I'm, I'm, I broke my promise to my family that I always come back. Broke my promise to my son. I'll never let him grow up without his dad like I did. But most importantly, I'm going to break my promise to my dad that I'll always take care of my family. And I'm laying there. It's like, this is it. And then that's what the LT says, DT, you're not going to die here. And he helps me up. And we both jumped in the creek. And the sound I heard was the same sound you hear when you put a hot pan in cold water. But it's not a pan. It was my body. Yeah. And I look at the LT. I was like, like Sarah's like, yeah, this sucks. <laughs> it's like, DT, are you trying to be funny? I'm like, no, sir, I just got blown up. I was on fire, had to jump in a freezing cold creek in December here in Afghanistan. It sucked. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know if it was just me subconsciously trying to calm the situation down, but as soon as they hit me, they hit the guys that we're going to go pick up up on the mountain in a crossfire. So now they're calling back, hey, where's Gunslinger? Where's Gunslinger? We need cast. No radios I had were destroyed. Me were destroyed. Yeah. One of the my backup were in the truck just got blown up, and I had to figure out what to do again. Rem remembering that promise to my dad. Yeah. Take care of your family. Like I said earlier, we're Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force. You know, Space Force didn't exist back then because it was still in a galaxy far, far away. Perfect. But you know, but we're all brothers and sisters. They're my family. I had to figure out what to do. And the medic was trying to take care of me. You know, I was like, no, no, I'm good. All I asked him was like, dude, cut off my, my ranger panties because the elastic was burning me. 
Oh. Uh, and, and, you know, yeah, my leg hurt. I saw a, couple, a little bit of blood, but I was okay. I was like, where about our, our Gunner Bailey who got got blown out and the truck had run over his legs? Oh, my God. Like, focus on him. Because I, I had to focus on, on the our other half of our team that's, you know, in the tank and, and the aircraft. So, luckily, one of the other scout guys had a numb better. I was like, hey, man, get on this frequency. Repeat everything I say. So we can get some some help out here, and people ask me, "Well, did you control it?" It's like, no, I, I did coordination, and I'm not sure if it was Furman or or my or my troop um, uh, was it Shank, who I left behind in, in, in our little uh, base because I knew it was a dangerous mission. Yeah, like, I don't know if it was one of those two that did a type two, uh, but when the last transmission went out, man. As much as I wanted to be Rambo, and maybe for a moment I did feel like Rambo, like nerves of steel, nothing was hurting me. But once that last transmission went out, dude, I started having a hard time breathing. I was getting scared. Yeah. Uh, I was like, dude, where's the medevac? Where's the medevac? Because I, I was getting scared. Uh -huh. uh, I was having a hard time breathing, and I told the medic, hey, man, let me just lay down and close my eyes for a bit. Let me just rest. And because I didn't think I was that bad, I was like, "Yeah, my arm, my leg hurt, but I have all my all my body parts." Yeah. yeah. But he knew if he let me fall asleep, most likely I'm not going to wake up again. Oh my god! So he kept he kept me uh, up. He he was trying to help me find my spark to get me going till the medevac came. Mm -hmm. And you know he starts like, "Come on, DT, fight for you, fight for your wife, fight for your wife." And, and I look at him, it's like, dude, that's not going to work. Try something better. <laughs> I'm kidding. You're getting too serious on me, bro. You're getting too serious on me. <laughs> but but what he, but no, what he really did use was my son. Because he had known, he had known that I had lost my dad when I was young. And I always said, I'll never let that happen to my son. Yeah. So he started saying, he started using my son. I was like, come on, DT, fight for your boy. He said, you'll never let him grow up out of his dad like you did. Fight for your boy. And he's making me yell it. I got to fight for my boy. I got to fight for my boy. And then he says the weirdest thing, man. And I'm not joking. <laughs> he's like, come on, DT. Fight for your son so you can teach him to be a pimp. <laughs> like, did he really just say that? <laughs> and he says it again. So there's, there's Sergeant Del Toro, butt naked in Afghanistan, yelling as loud as he can. I got to fight for my son so I can teach him to be a pimp. But you know, it, <laughs> I mean, it worked, right? <laughs> it worked. It kept me going until the medevac came. And I remember they wanted to carry me. I was like, oh, hell no. I walked into this fight. I'm going to walk out of it. Nice. And I hobbled with my naked ass to the helicopter, thinking to myself, oh, my God. I was like, I'm finally going to relax. And they're probably going to give me some good drugs right now. Oh, yeah. And... I remember the flight in and out, landing in our fob, and then be, being taken to the little field hospital we had there. Uh, seeing us, like I remember seeing uh, some of my army buddies, uh, like Furman was there, and the doc cutting off my watch and telling me you're gonna be okay. It was February, or I mean uh, December fourth, two thousand five. I wake up March of '06, man. Four months I was in a coma. Oh my God. And it, it's crazy being in a coma. No doubt. It doesn't really hit you until a year later. You know, I mentioned how I was a, I was a big baseball guy. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, it was uh, January of 2007, and I'm watching Sports Center. And I hear, this is a one year anniversary of Kerber Puckett's death. I'm like, when did per Kerber Puckett die? But it was when I was in a coma. So yeah. it's crazy. Four months out of your life, you have no memory of nothing. So you just, so you went in and four months later, it was like you just woke up and you don't remember anything at all. You didn't wake up at all during the whole thing or, man, oh man. You know, I, w I wake up and they start asking you, me, they signed a Toro, uh, do you know where you're at? It's like, well, obviously I got hurt. I'm thinking launch tool. You know, it's like, no, you're, you're in San Antonio. 
Okay. Do you know the date? December something? No, sorry, it's March of 06. Jeez. And you're like, holy shit. And, and, and now they're going into what had happened to you. The gas under the tower, 80% of your body has third degree burns. We gave you a 15% chance to survive. You almost died on us three times. And, and yeah, now you're awake, but you're still going to be here for another year and a half. You may not walk again. You'll be on a respirator for the rest of your life. And, and your career is pretty much over. And and they're waiting for me to respond. And I couldn't move because of my, my, my muscles are atrophied. I'm all wrapped yeah. up. I'm seeing that I have, you know, lost digits on my hands. And, you know, they pretty much, I pretty much, they had to read my lips because I had a trach. I pretty much told them, you can kiss my ass. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to accept that diagnosis. I am not going to accept you telling me what my life's going to be. I'm going to choose what my life is going to be. And from that day, man, I, I pushed, I asked them, get me up, get me trying to get walking again. And, and, and you figured learning how to walk again would be easy, but it was one of the most some painful things I ever went through. And then when you're severely burned, your skin becomes hypersensitive. Oh. And you, you could have rubbed a feather across my hand and it felt like you were cutting me with razor blades. Uh, but I had every day go to therapy and hit my hands against carpet, rocks, you know, marbles, whatever. So I can eventually, you know, see my son and hold him. Cause that's, all, that's, that was my spark. I wanted to see my boy. Yeah. Uh, uh, but then I started noticing I, while I was in, you know, when I was during recovery, that the burn guys weren't treated the same as the amputees. Like our therapy room, uh, where we had uh, our, our therapy was maybe the size of a, like a normal living room. Mm-hmm. Yet the amputees there at BAMSI, at Brook Island Medical Center, was like five times the size. Oh, okay. And so, yes, I, I miss being with the guys down range. But I knew all these wounded guys that were here now were my teammates. Sure. Yes, I was wounded, but I was still an NCO in the Air Force. And the job of the NCO is to take care of his troops, even though that he may never see any of the benefits. Right. So I started becoming a big advocate for these guys. Uh, because I remember when the CFI was about to open, they wanted us all to be there, all the burn guys in the audience. Because we outnumbered the amputees, I want to say five to one. Oh, okay. Uh, but yet, they weren't going to have any of us in the CFI. But you wanted us to, there in the audience for show. So I, I, I said, I, I, I told them all, we're not going to show up and, and kiss our ass. Yeah. And I, we're, we're not going to be props. Right, right. For, for a place of, you know, generals and celebrities. And, and we're not even going to be allowed inside that facility. Mm-hmm. And the leadership came down. They heard about it, the fancy leadership. And, and I, you know, I, I went off. I'm like, I'm sorry, sir. You know, I probably should have used better tack. <laughs> and I, I, I was like, what? I was blown up. What are you going to send me down range again and get blown up again? <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, I was like, it's bullshit. I was like, you want us to be prop, but you're, you're not going to let any of us be in the CFI? to say to the art therapy and and my intention was never for me to be the first to be there i wanted it from my guys right but you know i ended up being the first one they allowed in and then guys started coming in but you know i i had to do it you know because like it just wasn't right because we yeah. were almost treated like second class citizens that's so weird that they would do that like i mean what's like, what was their rationale for that? Like, what, I mean. No one knows, man. I don't know who, you know, was in charge of, you know, that decision. But I was, they realized it probably wasn't a smart one. Yeah, no doubt. You know, and probably wasn't working there anymore <laughs> after that. <laughs> right. But, you know, I, I, that's what I did. I became an advocate. And then, you know, I eventually left that hospital two months after I did wake up, you know, walking and breathing my own, nice. beating those odds. And then, you know, like I said, they just just trying to keep being stronger, trying to go back 
to the hospital, you know, obviously I still went back, you know, yes, I was out of the hospital walking and breathing at home, but my stamina wasn't to par. Like I could walk a hundred feet and I was just exhausted. So I had to build that up. So I kept going back to therapy. Yeah. So while I was there, I'll go to the ICU and, and talk to these guys and help them try it and find their spark. It's like, hey man, I know where you're at. I've been there. Yes, it sucks. Don't give up, man. I was like, it's like your mind's a very powerful thing. You, see, you got this, believe it, get that spark. You know, if it's, you know, someone says you can't do it, let that be your spark. It's like, oh, I'm gonna show you I can do it. Definitely. You know, if it's your kids or your, your loved ones, let that be your spark. So I kept going back, just trying to, you know, motivate these guys. Just like, you know, my medic did for me when I was down range, when I wanted to fall asleep. Right. I wanted to pay it back. Uh, and then, you know, people started then asking me, hey, DT, uh, what do you want to do? It's like, what do you mean? Career rise. It's like, well, I want to continue to serve. It's like, why? <laughs> what do you mean? Dude, you, you, you get out, you get where you time your disability, and, and you're getting pretty good at the speaking thing, which, you know, they do good. Some good, some high end speakers make like six figures. Right, right. You know, for 45 minutes to an hour speech. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I used to tell them, it's like, it's like, okay, there's thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people out there that make a lot of money and hate their job, mm. hate what they do. So why am I going to give up my job that I love? I love being in the Air Force. I love serving my country. I love being a TAC-P. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I know I can't be an operator downrange, even as much as I want to. You know, even if they asked me, I would go in a heartbeat. Sure. But, well, but I can't, unless we get like to Star Wars and I get a cool Luke Skywalker hand and I use the <laughs> Jedi mind trick and I want, right. okay, I, I, we can do it. But we're not there yet. But yeah. I knew I can instruct. You know, I can, I can teach the next generation of operators. Sure. Get them going. And, and I and I remember people saying, "It's like, is that the first face we want to show young airmen that want to be operators?" You know, is Zardal Toro. And my response was, "If these guys see me and see the reality of what possibly can happen and the danger of our job, and still want to do it." Those are the guys I want doing my my job. Definitely, those are the guys I know know the risk and still want to do it. Yeah, for you sure. Know? And so you know, I fought. They said they couldn't run. Well, I'll show them how to run. Well, you can't run. Okay, I'll put a rock on. I'll show you I can run. <laughs> uh, and then you know, it was like December of two thousand nine. It was right before Thanksgiving or Christmas break. I get the med board, and they had me sit in. Like, all right, Sergeant Del Toro, these are our findings. 100% disabled, medical retirement. And I was like, okay, I was expecting that. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, all right, 100% disabled, but able to re-enlist and, and become an instructor. I was like, sweet, I'll, I'll take it. Nice. And they're like, no, 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 wait. You got a third option. I'm like, what? what's the third option? <laughs> there was either I was going to get out or I was going to stay in. All right, all right. And they're like, 100% disabled, medical retirement, come back as a GS-11 instructor. And I was like, oh, I was not expecting that. Yeah. At all. And, and I asked him, how long do I have to decide? I was like, well, after the Christmas break. Said, all right. So I come, go home. And I remember I, I called uh, Klukas and Lunk and, and told them, you know, because they're kind of mentors. And yeah, good mentors. They both said to me, it's like, DT, why are you calling us? You know what you already want to do. Yeah. And the next day, dude, I was like, I went in. I was like, I want to stay in. I want to reenlist. It's like, sorry, the story you got till the end. It's like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And then on February 2010, I became the first 100% disabled airman ever to reenlist. Nice. Yeah.
which speaks volumes about you, man, just about your, uh, just your integrity and your intestinal fortitude. I mean, you're just, that's, that's speak, that says it all right there. Yeah, man. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's, I really love doing my job. And, you know, I loved instructing. And, you know, and at the same time, I, I did go out and, and, and speak. And I remember people asking me, you know, uh, Sergeant Otto, when are you going to write a book? I'm like, dude, I was like, I was like, I'm still young. I have so many adventures to do. You know, I'm thinking in my head, only old people write books. Right. I don't know if that's now telling me that I, I'm an old person, you know, <laughs> but, but, but I also used to say, it's like, dude, I don't even like reading. And you want me to write a book? Right. Uh, like, <laughs> and so, you know, people kept asking, kept asking. I was like, you know, no, no, I still got adventures and I was still active. Mm-hmm. I was still doing the job. You know, I, I did the instructor role for about five years. Then I started to excel in Paralympic a sports para athlete and became, you know, the first uh, world class para athlete for the Air Force. You know, they PCS me out here in 2015 to the Olympic Training Center to prepare for the Paralympics as a, a thrower and a shooter. And I, because I, I own three world records in shot put, discus, and javelin. Nice. Uh, but then, you know, once the para was over, I had to figure out what to do. Uh, it was like 2017. And I remember uh, my buddy, Jason Hopper, was at the academy uh, there at the parachute team. And he asked me, hey, DT, you always, you taught enlisted side. You mind coming over and, and kind of teach the, the officer side? You know, like, dude, an 18-year-old is an 18-year-old. They're all dumbasses. There's going to be no difference. You know? So I'm like, yeah. It's like, okay, will you come speak to with the commander? He really would want you to come here because he also knows how you came back from the instructor role and 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 these cadets kind of forget that they're still in the military and they're acting like fools. Yeah. Uh, I was like, okay, Roger that. So I go, I talk to the commander and he's like, yeah, son. So I'm so saying the same thing. I, I know of your reputation. I would love to have you here. I would love for you to kind of get these cadets back in the right direction. It's like, okay, cool. And then he says, do you want to jump again? I'm like, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> you know, the last time I had jumped was freaking 12 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was like, oh, oh, hell yeah, I would love to jump again. I was like, all right. Definitely. And I remember coming home and I told my wife, I was like, okay, hon, I think I got a new job at the academy teaching cadets how to skydive. As soon as I said the word skydive, it's like, don't you tell me you're going to be jumping again. <laughs> Uh, uh, maybe, maybe, and she's like, she's like, are you kidding me? I was like, you haven't gone through enough and you want to now jump? It's like, how are you going to do it anyways with your hands? Like, really? You're doubting me, huh? Right, After right. all we've been through and people say After you can't. Everything, yeah. I, I want to show up, man. And so, you know, they get me in, they adapt a, a harness for me, the toggles for me. Uh, and I think it was my thing in March of 2017. I got, I did my 130th jump. Yeah. That's awesome. And it was, oh my God, it was the best feeling, dude. I'll bet. Having yeah. been back out there, you know, under canopy. Oh my God, it was such a great, great feeling. <laughs> and, and you know, and I, I, I did that until my time of retirement. You know, I want to say it was around November of 2018, and I was like, you know what? I think it's time. Not no, I, I still wanted to serve, but I, I knew I, I was up for chief, and I knew I was going to make it. And my, and but I knew as soon as I make it, they're going to PCS me. Yeah. And my son was going to be a senior that following year, and I didn't want to move him a senior year. Sure. So I remember telling the commanders like. It's like, ma'am, I think it's time for me to retire. She's like, are you sure, DT? I was like, yeah. And it's like, well, I, th- I think you should, you're going to make chief DT. I was like, ah, I, I know, but I think it's time. And then, you know, I didn't, I wasn't, I was planning on retiring April uh, of 2019 to have my ceremony. My last day will be August of 2019. 
that I was going to have my ceremony in April, actually on my birthday. And I remember, I want to say like maybe a month prior to, uh, or a month and a half prior to my ceremony, I get a call. And it's uh, General Goldfein, Chief of Staff of the Air Force. It's like, Senator Torre, here you're going to retire. It's like, yes, sir. Why are you going to do that? You're going to be a chief. We need you still. Please stay. We want you to be a chief. Like, I was like, sir, I get, I get it. I'm honored, truly am honored that you're calling me to stay in. But it's time. You know, my family has sacrificed over 22 years for me. Yeah. It's, it's time for me to sacrifice for them. I was like, but if you're worried about we'll PCSing you, you know, we'll keep you there. Like, well, any, any of us have been here long enough, we know that. They'll say that, but you know, they'll move <laughs> yeah. still. And I was like, sir, I appreciate you calling me. It means a lot, but it's time. It's like, well, sir, I'm sad to hear you that you're going to retire, but thank you for your service and what you've done for us and how you've motivated. And it, it meant, like I said, it, when I hung up, I was like, wow, I just had the chief of staff of the Air Force call me. Oh, I had to feel good. Yeah, they had to feel good. Yeah, it, it was cool. Uh, and then, you know, I, I retired on my, on, on my birthday, April 27th of 2019. And then, you know, I kept speaking. And and there were times where I was like, man, it would have been cool finishing as a chief. <laughs> and, and then I realized, oh, COVID happened. I was like, I got out just in time. I just made it, yeah. <laughs> just in time, because I heard of the madness that the guys went through, you know. Oh, yeah. Going to school, but at home, and still having to be in uniform. I was like, why make it worse? Yeah. I was like, nah, I'm good. Uh, yeah, you but, dodged a bullet for sure. But, you know, then I was like, well, all my speech was canceled. What am I going to do now? Well, maybe I'll start this book thing, you know. I wasn't in the military, I wasn't speaking, you know. And so I started, you know, obviously I didn't write it because if I try to write, I could tell my story. Sure. But you put me in front of a computer and say, okay, write this. I'll start with the word duh. Six hours later, I still get the word duh. Right. <laughs> so I, 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 a friend introduced me to this ghostwriter and she was great, man, Trisha. Uh, she kind of had experienced lost. Uh, she lost her husband with two little boys, you know, young. So we kind of connected that way, and having that same loss. Uh, was a little different, but still experiencing it. Uh, and she captured my essence in the book. Uh, the few people that have, I gave advanced copies to, you can say it's like DT, it's like you speaking. Yeah. It sounds like you. And it was a cool process, you know, learning, you know, me just sitting down, talking, her having to record and then taking notes. And then a week later, getting back together and me going over and it's like, okay, no, this doesn't sound like me. Let's change this. Or you forgot this. And it was about a year process. And and, and people asked, why did you write? Why did you do it? Finally, I was like, yes, you know, I figured it was time. And yes, it was COVID. There's nothing else for me to do. Mm -hmm. But I also saw it as like, I have a, a much greater audience I can touch with my story and my journey. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, you can do as much public speaking, but you can't go into way into detail. You kind of hit the the highlights, but all the knickknack things like, you know, about my mom was never in there and other yeah. situations in the book. I never, I don't, I, you know, you don't hear about in my, in my speeches. And, and I wanted to be able to, to uh, help more people. Because yes, people call me a hero and it's still, I don't, I don't like it. I don't see myself as a hero. I'm just DT or inspiring. You know, I, I just don't see myself in that light. Uh, it didn't really hit me about what my, how my words impacted people until this one time I, it's, Oh, 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 Kaka. Well, people, Chachi, you know, Pachesa. Yeah, yeah. You know, I always call him Kaka because that was his original. You know, oh. Kaka, not, 
not Tai Chi, <laughs> asked me, he's like, hey, DT, we come speak to uh, my airman out here at McGuire. I was like, yeah, sure. So they had me out there and the whole base was out there. And I do my speech and I open it up for questions and answer usually. Some people ask questions, some people don't. Some people wait till afterwards when they want to meet me and shake my hand. And sometimes people just wait and do it on social media and send me a direct DM. But this young airman, this A1C, stands up. I'll never forget her. Stands up, like, Sandal Toro, I've tried to end my life many times. But after hearing how you never gave up and the journey you went through from a young age with the obstacles, it helped. It has helped me find my spark, oh, man. And, and found me that I still enjoy living. And I was like, "Holy crap!" <laughs> this young A1C just stood up in front of all her leadership and said that. That's when it hit, hit me. When I was like, "My words have an impact on people." Yeah. And and I'm a realist, man. I know I'm not gonna touch everyone out there. But those one or two, like that A1C, that really need to hear it. All that pain, all that suffering I went through throughout my life was worth it for me helping help someone find their spark and find the joy in life. And and that's why the main reason why I, I ended up, you know, writing the book of Patriots Promise because for that one or two that really truly need it, you know, uh, that's you know it's awesome. not, for me it was never about you know, well, are you going to be a bestseller? Are you going to, you know, make all this money? It's like, uh, you know, I'm happy where I'm at, man. Yeah. You know, uh, as long as I got my wife, my boy that loved me, my dog, I'm cool. You know, anything else is just, you know, icing on the cake. Uh, but it's really about me honoring that promise to my dad. Mm -hmm. Come back to the beginning. Helping my family. Promise to help your family. Yeah. Anyone out there now that needs it, here's my family. And, and I hope that this book is able to help those that really need it. Because, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say I never had a bad time. I never had a bad day. Of course, dude, I went from a 200-pound muscle head to a 115-pound, tiny, frail, scared. You know, I, I, I look like a podcast host. <laughs> but, but you know, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, you're gonna have bad days. But the goal is not to dwell in it and have that help. And I had that support. I had my family members. I had my teammates. Yeah. You know, that were there for me when I did have those bad times. And, and that's what I hope that this book does to help those people that were in those bad times are able to overcome it yeah. and get past it and don't dwell in it. And, and, and that's my goal. And it's really just a 12 year old kid trying to honor that man. So I, well, I think it's commendable, dude. I, I think, and like you said, I mean, some of the, all those supports you had, like that, maybe that A1C didn't have those supports and you're the only support that she had and it worked. And yeah, I think it's great, man. I think that you're doing a great thing. I, I think people need to hear this kind of stuff. No, and, and you know, you know, and I thank you, JD, for having me on here to be able to do that. You know, to give me that oh, opportunity sure. to kind of speak and talk about, you know, this this book that's coming out, so I can it get it gets out to people and, and maybe help get it'll get to the hands of the one person that person that really needs it. Definitely. And, and so I, I thank you. I really do thank you. You know. Oh, not at all, man. You reached I, out. My I, pleasure, for sure. I was like, for sure, bro. I got you, man. I was like, I'll be there. You, even though you already had it, got it done, I was like, "Oh, never mind." <laughs> I know. Well, I didn't. Like I said, I didn't know how you did it, so I was like, "Well, I guess I'll just do it this other way." So, yeah. No, yeah, man. And I, I truly thank you, JD, for allowing me to be on, on your podcast. Like uh, I said, not at all, man. I, I, you, like I said in the beginning, you, your story is like just so imp inspirational, and like it's. It's an example, like I said, you set the example, man. You're setting the standard for guys that, for anyone at all that has any kind of adversity. And I, I appreciate you doing it. I mean, it's, it's awesome. I appreciate it. No, oh, thanks, JD. I, it, it means a lot. It, you know, I'm getting a little bit better on accepting, you know, people saying stuff like that to me, you know, even though I still, I'm still not 
as comfortable when people call me a hero. Like I remember when we were trying to think of a title for the book, I always knew the, the word promise was going to be there. That's one thing I was like, the word promise has to be in the title. And they wanted to first say a hero's promise. I'm like, oh, dude, that, that yeah. sounds douchey. That sounds kind of, <laughs> right. you know, if someone was writing a book about me, okay, let them, if they want to use that title. That's book. their call. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. me writing that kind of memoir to my journey. Uh, and so we came up with the Patriots. Like, okay, I can, I can handle that. You know, that, but that illustrates you, man. I mean, you're you're the kind of guy who is doing this not for the accolades and the recognition, but solely to help others. I mean, that I mean that's and that's why it's great and that's why it works because you're not you're not doing you're doing it for the right reasons. Let's put it that and, way. And, so, and and I always wanted to be, I never wanted to become that guy where, yes, I I have friends that are presidents. I have. Friends that I wrote to, I have celebrity friends. Yeah. But for me, it's when guys like you or my teammates hit me up, say, hey, DT, let's go hang out. I was like, let's go. Yeah. I never wanted to be that guy where he acts like his shit don't stink. Yeah. I was like, I'm not, because I remember meeting one of my heroes. Uh, 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 I thought it was a hero, someone I admired in baseball. And he was so shitty. Yeah. It, it makes you, it made me wish I never met him. And so I can still have him at that high level of right. admirement. And so I said, I'll never be that guy. If someone wants to come say hi to me, come say hi to me. Yeah. If, you know, even in the gym, maybe, maybe not when I'm in the middle of a lift, but if I'm just <laughs> right. resting, come say hi to me, go ahead. Or yeah. in the streets. Or, or you know, I, I'm always going to say yes. I was like, come on, you know. You know, when I won the ESPY, man, I had so many people reach out to me. And and I got back to every single one. And I want to say it was about 800 people sent me messages. And it took me a while, but yeah. I wanted to have that decency say, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for those kind words you said. And, and that's how I, I try and live life. And and I got a wife, too, that says, like, hey, slow your roll a little. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, don't keep you me in Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> Uh, but again, I just, I, you know, I, I never wanted to be that guy. And I just want to be just, you know, regular DT that his friends call him up. It's like, hey, you want to go have a drink? Let's go have a drink. Uh, yeah, that's, well, that's, you definitely are, man. You, you, you definitely embody that, that kind of sentiment. So, yeah, you're doing it right for sure. Uh, definitely. Again, thanks, JD. I appreciate it. Like, yeah, Appreciate man. you having me on here on your podcast. Man. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah, my pleasure, man. Yeah, my honor right here. Uh, is there anything else that I know you, you got the book and uh, is there anything else you're working on? Any kind of like um, charities or uh, yeah. initiatives or anything that you want to highlight before we yeah. get off here? You know, I always, I always, uh, you know what, people always ask me about, you know, what charities do you do help? And, you know, there's a few uh Big ones that I, I hope, but I always tell people, go to like your local charities that are in town. Yeah. Because a lot of more of that money goes back to whatever cause you're supporting. Uh, yeah. You know, yes, you know, I, I, I support the, the Tunnels of Towers, the guys that help, you know, uh, wounded service members and, and Gold Star families of not only service members and, and uh, first responders, but, you know, like, also help, you know, uh, Fisher House, you know, the Bob Woodruff Foundation. And then the small local ones are, there's one in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, you know, honored to sacrifice, started by uh, an army guy that lost both of his legs. And it's all volunteer. Wow. And he gives back, you know. That's one I help all, all, every year. Nice. And the one locally here in, in Colorado Springs is, uh, what is it? Angels of America's Fallen, where where they help, because that that one really means a lot to me, because what they do is like, if a first responder or a military dies, uh, in the line of duty, and their children say they're play piano or play sports, they pay for their all that stuff until they're eighteen. Wow, so, something that's precious to me because I lost my parents. Yeah. And sports helped me kind of get through that. Sure. Uh, so that was that was something special. And 
you know, those are, those, those are ones that I help and I tell people, you know, just do your research and again, do local. A lot yeah. of times those, a lot of that money goes back to the cause because yeah, there's big, the big ones are out there and, and you just got to do research, you know, in yeah, 90, 96, you know, of that money goes back to the cause. But a lot of times the small local ones, almost all of it goes back to the cause. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you know, yeah. I just, yeah. I just try and That's do a good that. point for sure. Yeah. Try and get Cause people, people want to do that, that, you know, they want to go to these, these national level charities. And like you said, a lot of it goes to operations and administration and, I mean, if you got some local charity where it's mostly volunteers and it's, yeah, you, that's a good point. That's and, good point. Yeah. That's good. And, and, you know, hopefully, you know, you know, once, uh, you know, on July 4th, you know, if you want to pick up a good book, Patriots Promise, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it'll be available, you know, people can pre-order it now, but it'll be everywhere. You know, people ask me, has it hit you yet? I'm like, no, not really. I was like, Maybe once I see it like in a store and I'm like, oh, shit. I was yeah. like, I really did this. Uh, but I just, I just hope people enjoy it and, and it helps. You know, that's yeah. my only goal out of this book uh, is to help people and, and honor my dad. Definitely. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I'm excited to, 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 to take a look at it. I mean, I, it's, it's got to be fascinating. And, and I'm glad you put on all that stuff about your childhood, too. I mean, that's, I think people, I think it's important not only are they inspired by what you've done, but inspired where you came from. I think that's a big part of it. So yeah, that's good. Thanks that's again. Awesome. Thanks again, yeah, man. Well, again, I appreciate it, dude. Thanks a lot for coming on here. And uh, again, uh, um, keep doing what you're doing. I mean, it's very, it's very inspiring for sure. So yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Thanks. It's good seeing you. Um, uh, I, I was, I love, this is my favorite part is like getting guys on here that I, I get to just talk to, you know, that I haven't seen in uh, forever and, um, just, uh, just kind of catching up. So yeah, th thanks again for doing that. And as well, I appreciate it. Uh, anytime, man, anytime, yeah, man. Any, anything from our brothers, man. Right um, on. Your backs. Cool. All right, DT, uh, have a good one and, uh, yeah, uh, keep in touch. I will do brother. And if you're right, ever in Colorado Springs, man, hit me up. Definitely will. I will. All right, dude. You take care, man. All right, dude. I'll see you later. Laters.